out to Ogden Kids Worship. The rest of us are going to be in Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm a little nervous. I can honestly say I've never preached in front of a giant volcano. So, uh, hey, the fire's going already. Right. Hey, listen. <laughs> oh, this should be interesting. We are excited because tonight kicks off one of my favorite weeks of the year, Vacation Bible School. Uh, we're going to have, we, we, we will have close to 50 kids here tonight and throughout the week. And uh, any more that God brings, we're excited to, to take. But I'm excited about the possibilities of what this week holds. Uh, for all of you, as Michaela mentioned, for all of you who have volunteered your time this week, whether you're leading uh, a certain age group, or whether you're working in a rotation, or whether you're serving in the kitchen, or in the sound booth, or working security, or wherever you may be serving, let me say from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your investment in the lives of children, and for your service to King Jesus this week. Amen. I believe we have a mandate directly from God in the scriptures to train and to disciple children so that we may bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. We're going to see that here this morning. In fact, Vacation Bible School is just one avenue that we are seeking to faithfully pursue that calling to bring up children in the Lord. With that being said, as we head into this week, I always like to give a certain disclaimer. Uh, some of that probably should have already been given. Uh, but I'm thankful for weeks like this because they challenge our conventions of what worship is supposed to be like. This week, children are going to fill this place, and they aren't going to be dressed in their Sunday best. And the music is probably going to be a little more lively than we're used to. And there's going to be some dancing and jumping around involved. And it's going to be noisy at times. But listen to me. Make no mistake that what some might call noise, God calls worship. And so we're going to sing. And we're going to get excited. And we're going to be about the work of God this week. And how we're ministering and loving these kids in the name of Jesus. This week, we're going to continue our study through the book of Ephesians. And we just so happen to be beginning chapter 6, where God speaks to us directly about children. But not only that, he shares with us that our, what our role is, uh, or that our role as parents and grandparents, and I believe even as the church, that our role is to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. And so let's read this together. Ephesians 6, verses 1 through 4. Let's read this together. It says, Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Let's pray. Father God, this is our cry. Lord, we want to see children and families come to know you. We want to see a generation of new believers. We want to see your word go forth. We want to see your name proclaimed. And God, I am excited tonight to be able to, to gather together with brothers and sisters in Christ, to serve alongside this week, brothers and sisters in Christ, as we minister to the families of our community as we love others and share the gospel to children and to families. Lord, I pray that you would take all of these efforts and all of this prayer that's been prayed and all of the work that's been put in, and that ultimately, God, that you would take these physical labors and that you would turn them into spiritual fruit, that you would take the, the work that's been done and the investment that's been done here and that you would transform that into life transformation and heart transformation into spiritual uh, into spiritual lives being turned to you. And God, that you would move in a mighty and miraculous way this week. God, I believe that it is only through your power and your spirit moving, Father God, that we can see any lasting impact. And so God, I pray that you would simply do that, that you would uh, move in the lives of these children, that you would move in our hearts as volunteers, as workers. 
just in the lives of us as believers. God, I pray that you would be with us here this morning. Lord, as we open up this text and begin to walk through it and see some of the depth and power and majesty of who you are and what you've called us to as believers, I pray that you would give us understanding. I pray, even as the psalmist said, that you would open our eyes, that we might see and behold wonderful things out of your law. So God, be with us now. Draw our hearts ever closer to yours. Remove distractions. And help us focus in on you. So Lord, we love you. And we pray these things in the most precious name of Jesus. Amen. This year's theme for Vacation Bible School is twists and turns. And much to some of y'all's chagrin that, that, that talked to me beforehand, I'm not going to get up here and do the twist. But this idea of twists and turns is centered around the idea that sometimes in life, things don't go as we expect them to. We may encounter a few twists and turns and ups and downs in life. And in those moments where you don't know where to turn or what to do, the Bible teaches us that following Jesus changes everything. That following Jesus is a game changer. And so as we encounter those seasons and those hardships, those ups and downs, we want to teach children, we want to teach everybody that might hear that ultimately Jesus is where our hope is found. That Jesus is the one that sets us on the right path. And that Jesus is the one that is always with us in all of life's ups and downs and twists and turns. Amen. So our goal and what we've been praying now for several months is that God will simply provide opportunities this week to introduce children and their families into a relationship with Jesus. Now, as we think on that aim, I believe that Ephesians 6 gives us some incredible directions for how we as the church are to approach our ministry towards children. The first thing that I think we should realize is that children are precious in the eyes of the Lord. Children are precious in the eyes of the Lord. The very first word there in Ephesians 6 verse 1 is children. And the fact here that children are even included in this instruction shows you just how different that the early church viewed children than the prevailing culture and societal norms of that day. In fact, as we study history, the Roman Empire was brutal in its approach to children. It was not uncommon in the Greco-Roman world to put kids on trash heaps for people to pick up and often turn into gladiators or, uh, or slaves or prostitutes. But the church, on the other hand, would pick up these children. They would welcome these children in. They would try to bring them up. Theologian John Stott said in his commentary on Ephesians, that it was a radical change in the church from the callous cruelty which prevailed in the Roman Empire, in which unwanted babies were often abandoned, weak and deformed ones were killed, and even healthy children were regarded by, his, by many as a partial nuisance because they inhibited sexual promiscuity and complicated an easy divorce. So in a world and a time when most people saw children as a hindrance, when they saw children as a problem to be avoided, the church embraced this reality that children are precious in the eyes of the Lord. And therefore, the children, uh, children should be held in high regard and valued by us. Now, I believe that there are two primary reasons why the church held this view. One reason is because we see these same values in the Old Testament. When we study the Old Testament, when we look at what the Old Testament says, it clearly states that children are a blessing, that children were to be valued and, and, and to be regarded uh, as a heritage. In fact, Psalms 127, verses 3 through 5 says this, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver with them. So children are a heritage, a blessing. They're a legacy from the Lord. We can point to numerous testimonies or numerous passages in the Old Testament that echo this same sentiment. 
We've already looked in Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 7, that talks about passing on the truths of God's word to your children and talking about them regularly. We look at Proverbs 17, 6, and Psalms 139, and Jeremiah 1. All of those talk about the value of children. In fact, the value of children is clear even before they are born. Psalms 139, verses 13 and 14 says it this way. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I, in my mother's womb, I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. See, this value is found in the fact that regardless of their age, regardless of their nationality, regardless of their socioeconomic status, each and every individual is made in the image of God. And therefore, their value, has, and for that reason, they have great value in the eyes of God. And so the early church understood this. They understood what the Old Testament said about children. So for that reason, they saw it as part of their responsibility to raise up children in the Lord, to hold them in high regard and value them as precious to the kingdom of God. But I think it goes beyond just the fact that the Old Testament valued them. I believe one of the main reasons why the early church was so countercultural is because the very example of Jesus is that the very example we see in Jesus is that Jesus held children in high regard. In fact, when I was little, we used to sing a song. Maybe you've heard this song, you know this song. I don't hear it as much today, but it goes something like this: that Jesus loves the little all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. What a great reminder, what a great truth that children are precious to Jesus. In fact, multiple times throughout his ministry, we see Jesus interacting with children, even using children as an example of faith and pointing all of us to what true obedience and life in Christ should look like. Probably most famously, we see in Mark chapter 10, verses 14 through 16, where Jesus is teaching a group of adults and parents are trying to bring their children to Jesus for him to lay his hands on them, to bless them. And the disciples see this. They see Jesus doing this important work of teaching. And in their minds, they're thinking culturally, they're thinking, hey, this is too important for Jesus to stop in order to deal with these kids. And yet when Jesus sees the disciples trying to turn these children away, what does he do? He says there in Mark 10, verse 14, he says, let the children come to me. Do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly, I say to you that whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms and blessed them, laying his hands on them. Amen. See, that's what this is. It's why we devote so much time and energy and effort to this one week out of the year, the Vacation Bible School. We've always been so much energy on decorations and making everything fun and, and, and preparing our hearts and praying and studying and getting ready because we want to make sure that we don't do anything this week that might hinder these kids from coming and experiencing Jesus and seeing who Jesus is and the path that he has for their lives. And so we see very clearly that children are precious in the eyes of God, that they were valued in the Old Testament, that they were valued by Jesus, and that they should be valued by us today as well. Secondly, we see that children were made by God to glorify God. Children were made by God to glorify God. Now, don't miss this, young people. And don't you miss this, church. I believe we've done children a great disservice at times when we treat them like their lives are in some kind of a holding pattern until you get old enough and then you're magically, and then you just magically expect them to become mature in their faith and love Jesus and want to serve Him when they reach a certain age. I know when I was in student ministry, I would hear it said all the time that I had problems with it then, I still have problems with it today. But I hear people all the time make this statement. Our children and our youth are the future of the church. Amen. Folks, that's false. That's false. You know why? Because the children, if you are here this morning, hear me, if you're here this morning, 
and you are under the age of 18, you can hear my voice. Hear what I'm about to say to you. You are part of the church now. God wants to use you. God has a purpose and a plan for how your life might glorify Him here and now in this moment. You do not have to wait until you are older in order to be a part of the church. You are part of the church now, and you can glorify God right here where you're at. See, depending on the stage of life you are in, how you are called to glorify God will change. Yes, absolutely. An adult is going to glorify God in ways that a child might not. But, the same, but that truth, that reality, that the way that we serve God changes with our stage of life is true across the board. We would never tell someone who is a senior adult who can no longer serve in the same way they once did, hey, you're the church of the past. So why would we dare tell a child you're the church of the past? miss the point that they can serve God right now. Now listen, I understand that people don't say that and mean any harm when they say it. But I'm always cautious when it comes to telling young people anything that might imply that they can't make a difference right here, right now, and that they have to wait and be the church of the future. Because we don't see that anywhere in Scripture. In fact, Jesus was only 12 years old when his father and mother found him listening and asking questions at the feet of the leaders of the temple. Most likely, based on the Jewish pattern, we were talking about this on Wednesday night some, most likely based on the Jewish pattern of discipleship, uh, when young men became disciples, the majority of Jesus' disciples were probably somewhere between the ages of 14 and 17 years old. And Jesus used them to change the world. It was a little boy who gave Jesus five loaves and two fish to feed the multitude. And so hear me, young people. You were made by God to glorify God here and now. And don't let anyone tell you differently. Now, as I said earlier, we glorify God in different ways based on the stage of life that we are in. And I think verses 1 through 3 of Ephesians chapter 6 uh, tells us and details for us how children are to glorify God. And just like he's already pointed out to us in chapter 5 about husbands and wives and how they're to glorify God and how they either submit or love the other one, children, we're going to see, are to glorify God through two different ways. He's going to give two imperatives, two commands for how children are to glorify God. And these two commands are you glorify God by obeying and by honoring your parents. You glorify God by obeying and honoring your parents. Look what it says there. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. That word for right is the Greek word diakos. It literally means that this is righteous. So it's not saying that, that this is correct or this is uh, okay, but saying this is righteous. That for you as a child to do what your parents say, to obey your parents in the Lord, is a righteous act. <clears throat> so understand, children, when you obey your parents in the Lord, when you hear what they are telling you to do and you do it, that act of obedience is righteous. It is glorifying to God. So when your parents tell you, let me be really practical with your voice, okay? I'm going to just mic it. So when your parents tell you to wash the dishes, and everything in you is going, to play, is going, I want to play video games. Or I want to go outside and play baseball. But instead, you listen to your parents, you deny yourself, and you obey in that moment. In that moment, washing the dishes and taking out the trash and feeding the dogs becomes an act of worship to God. Because you've chosen to deny yourself and to be obedient to what your parents have asked you to do. Now, why is this the case? I believe this is the case because it has everything to do with authority. With authority. You see, every person on this earth exists within a system of authority, where their life is under the authority of someone else. Every single person exists within a system of authority, even adults. We are all under the authority of someone, whether it be the government or the police or our 
You will find it nearly impossible to obey your heavenly authority, which you cannot see. And so he tells you to honor your father and mother, that it may go well with you, and that you may live long in the land. Colossians 3.20 says almost the same thing, but it has a different twist to it. It says, children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. So children, obey your parents. Now parents, if you know anything about your kids and your grandkids, are they going to do this perfectly 100% of the time? No. You know why? Because we all have a sinful and rebellious heart. We all have times when we mess up. And sometimes as parents, we're very guilty of kind of looking at our kids when they mess up or when they fall short, and we're guilty of kind of putting the, the fist down or getting angry about it or frustrated about it. And yet I believe as believers, one of the things that we're called to do in those moments when our kids fall short is yes, we discipline, yes, we instruct, but we also do so, we do so in such a way that it points our kids to the gospel and to grace. Parents should be the first example of grace that their kids see. As their parents love them and shepherd their hearts and lead them well. So he says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. He then tells kids to honor your father and your mother. And I believe these are two separate commands for a reason. Because if we're honest, technically it's possible to obey your parents without necessarily honoring them. Right? And so it's possible to obey your parents, to do what your parents said, but to do it in such a way that you don't honor your parents. So how does one go about honoring their parents? One way, and I believe one of the main ways, is through having a proper attitude in your obedience. See, children do not honor their parents when maybe they obey, they go do what they're asked to do, but they do it with a bad attitude, or they huff and they puff and they pout and they talk back to them. So it's not just a matter of obeying what your parents say that glorifies God. It's how you obey what your parents have asked you to do. And what you're going to see, and this is where I want to tie this all back together, that he ties this obedience to your parents to your worship of God. And that it's through honoring your parents and through obeying your parents and having the right attitude in how you do so that you actually honor and reflect and glorify God in the here and now. So children, you understand that you have a role to play right now. And part of that role, other than just serving, which I do believe there's a role, there's a reason that kids and children should be allowed to serve and be involved and invest in ministry from an early age. But one of the main ways the Bible says that you are to glorify God in the here and now of your life is through the willing submission and obedience and honoring of your parents. So children were created to glorify God. And now I believe the attention turns to us as parents, as fathers, as the church. I believe it turns to what our responsibility is. Look at verse 4. It says, fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So he gives this command, and he specifically addresses fathers. And I believe he does so because fathers are called to be the spiritual head of the household. And so the one who sets the, the, the kind of path and the, and, the, and the plan for the house, the fathers are the ones who are called to that spiritual headship role. But the reality is that both parents are in play here. He's not saying, you know, fathers, hey, don't provoke your kids. Moms, you can just annoy the snot out of them all you want to. That's not what he's saying. Instead, he's saying that both of you, parents, it is your responsibility to bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. I believe this command goes far beyond just the call of parents. I believe we as the church bear a responsibility to also do the same thing, to bring them up. In fact, I want to share with you three things here. The first thing I want us to see is that we are, to be, or, or, or we need to be, under, I want us to understand that we must be actively engaged in the discipleship of children. We must be actively engaged in the discipleship of children. So, 
How do we do that? The first thing I want us to see here is that we are responsible for setting children on a path for spiritual growth and development. It is our responsibility to set children on a path for spiritual growth and development. He uses this word here for bring them up. And it's the same word that he used back in chapter 5, which was translated as nourish. It means to feed, to care for, to provide what is needed in order for growth and substance and nourishment. And so I believe here that we as the church and we as parents are given the responsibility that we are to set children on a path in which they might grow and flourish in the Lord. This is why we do vacation Bible school. Because we want to see children get on that path. We want to see children understand and know that Jesus Christ loves them with an everlasting love. Jesus Christ loves you with an everlasting love. We want parents to know that Jesus loves them with an everlasting love. And so we will go to these extraordinary lengths. We will decorate and plan and, and publicize and invite and, and study and do all of these things because we believe that it is valuable in setting children on the right path of spiritual growth and Development. Church, this is why we must make children a priority. Because Christ has called us, has given us a spiritual organ, a spiritual obligation to help them grow and flourish in their faith. Hear me, church, when I say this. Because while I don't agree with the statement that children are just the future of the church. I can guarantee you this, that a church which has no children and doesn't prioritize discipling and nourishing and bringing children up in the Lord, I can guarantee you this, that while a church, that that church has no future. But we must make the discipleship and the pouring in to children with the word of God a priority in what we do. I believe we are to use both tools that God has provided for us in the process of discipleship. And both tools, the two tools that he specifically mentions here are discipline and instruction. He says we're going to bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. See, discipline is, against popular opinion, it's not something that's toxic. It's not toxic to discipline your children. In fact, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 says that it's one of the greatest acts of love that you can demonstrate to a child is to discipline them. To hold them accountable for what they're doing and the choices that they make. You see, discipline means accountability. And one of the greatest things you can teach a child is that there is accountability for their actions. So we discipline. Instruction means clarity of what the right choices are and why we should walk in them. And so instruction is teaching. And so you need both in ministering to your kids, in bringing up children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. You need both instruction and discipline. Both. And what I want us to see here is that both are essential. Especially if we're going to honor God in the way that verse 4 says we are and not provoke them to anger. See, two things will devastate the spiritual development of a child quicker than anything. One is discipline without instruction. Because discipline without instruction is abusive. It's punishing a child without ever explaining to them or telling them what's expected of them in the first place. It's, it's, it's holding them to a standard they didn't even know was a standard and then punishing them when they don't meet that standard. People, church, that's abusive. And so we need both discipline and instruction. So discipline without instruction is abusive, but instruction without discipline is pointless. If all we're doing is giving instruction but we're failing to hold people to a standard and there's no ramifications for when we fall short, then those words are going to, we're going to find very, very little weight. And so we need both discipline and instruction in the lives of our children as we seek to raise them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord, in the way that Christ has called us to. And the goal, the final thing that we see here, as we're seeking to bring children up in this way, the goal 
is that children would know Jesus, own their faith, and make him known. We want those three things in the lives of kids. Our desire this week is that kids, that the kids that come and are part of this week's Vacation Bible School would do one of those three things. That they would know Jesus, that they would own their faith, or that they would, and that they would make him known. If they don't know Jesus, if they've never been exposed, I can promise you we will have some kids this week who have no relationship with Jesus Christ. They don't go to a church. And so our prayer for them and our desire for them is that they would simply know who Jesus is. That they would know that Jesus loved them, that he died on the cross for their sins so that they could be forgiven. And so that they can now have a relationship with God. The same way that we have a relationship with our parents, God desires that kind of relationship with you. He desires an intimacy and a closeness in relationship with you. And he, did, he loves us so much that in order to do that, in order to bridge that gap of sin that sin has created in our life, he came in the form of Jesus. He came as the Son. Or the son, he sent the Son to die on the cross for our sins, that we could be forgiven. Amen. So we want kids to know of the hope that they have in Christ, of the love the Father has for them, of the love that Jesus has for them. Maybe there's some kids that have already been saved, but they haven't, what I call, owned their own faith yet. And I used to tell students all the time and tell parents all the time that there's what we call, uh, that, that Every child, especially children that were raised in the church, have to come to a point in their walk with Christ where they own their own faith. And what that means is that most children, at least at some point, they are operating under their parents' faith. Meaning that they come to church because their parents come to church, or their parents make them come to church. But every child that legitimately begins to walk with Christ and follow after Christ and pursue Christ in their life, there comes a point, a moment usually, and I love the opportunity sometimes at camp, sometimes at the vacation Bible school, sometimes in church services. To see those moments when kids really grab hold of it and they get it. Wow. You mean I can pursue a relationship with Christ on my own? You mean I can have, I can know Jesus, I can study his word, and he, he can speak to me? There's that moment when it clicks. And when now all of a sudden they're not just coming because their parents come, but they're coming because, you know what, I want to grow closer to Jesus. I want to be in community with the body. I want to own my own faith. And so for some this week, part of our prayer is that, that if they're already in Christ, if they're already attending a church or a part of this church, we want them to grow in their depth and their understanding of who Christ is and own their own faith. And then ultimately our desire is that if they know Christ and they own their faith, then the next step is that we want them to make him known. It's the same for each and every one of us. That when we truly know Jesus, when we truly love him and he has grabbed hold of our heart, you share what you share what lays on your heart. It's the same with anything. It's true with anything. If I'm passionate about something, we talked about this this past Wednesday. If I'm passionate about something, I'm going to share about that thing I'm passionate about. I use the example. You don't have to, if I meet somebody who's talking about baseball, you don't have to really twist my arm to talk about the Atlanta Braves right now. Why? Because I'm passionate about them. Because I'm excited about what they're doing. They're the best record in baseball. You guys know that. You don't have to twist my arm to talk about what I'm passionate about. But there's something way greater than a baseball team that we get to share. There's something way greater in Jesus Christ that we need to make known. And so our desire is that these children would understand their role in the kingdom. And that part of their role is to go and to find their friends and their family and their neighbors. And to tell them about the same Jesus that they're going to get to encounter this week's vacation Bible school. We want to know Jesus. We want these kids to know Jesus. We want them to own their own faith. And we want them to make him known to others. I believe this only happens when we as the church are doing our part in fulfilling this calling that God has placed before us to bring children up in discipline and the instruction of the Lord. What a task that has been set before us. I hope this week. I hope that you've been praying. If you haven't been praying, I hope that you will begin to pray now for this week of Vacation Bible School. If, like I said earlier, if you would like to serve and you haven't already got connected, we still have some places we can plug you in. Come see me. Come see Amanda. We'd love to get you plugged in and let you be a part. I would challenge you at some point this week, even if you're not a part of Vacation Bible School, come and just watch the excitement. Just come and, 
uh, observe opening rally here at 6 o'clock throughout, throughout this week, Sunday through Thursday. And just see the excitement of these kids. See their energy. Uh, and you'll find that you're energized by it as well. And so I would, I would love to be a part of that. So let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for this time that we get 